Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and high in favor, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. My parents' uh, friends got married in our home church and they were sat down in the hall to the side where they were having their, their wedding uh, lunch. And just before dessert, this man walked in with, with greasy matted hair uh, teeth that were all rotten and, uh, and sticking out and clothes that were dirty and stained. Uh, and everybody was looking at him as if to say, you know, what are you doing here? But he had a present under his arm. And he waved animatedly at the, the top table and, and rushed up to the top table. The bride looked like she was ready to make a run for it. And not a single person realized it was my dad dressed up playing a prank. <laughs> All they saw was the huge contrast between their finery and this dirty man. In verse 1, we met Naaman and we spent time last time thinking about all of the things that were revealed about this great man in the first verse. In verse 2 and 3, we meet a little girl who is as much a contrast to Naaman as black is to white. Naaman had authority, power, and respect. This little girl has none of those things. See, the army that Naaman commanded often raided the northern territories of Israel for food, valuables, and slaves. And in one of their raids, they carried off this little girl. We don't know how it happened. Maybe a Syrian soldier had hid by the local well waiting for kids to be innocently sent out to get water and she'd come down, he'd jumped out, covered her mouth and ran off back to camp. Maybe her mum had to come out to the horror of just finding the bucket on the floor. We, we don't know. Did they spend the next months and years searching, hoping that their little girl was going to come home? You know the story of Madeleine McCann in the UK and how for years parents just can't give up hope that one day she'll come home. Maybe it was worse than that on that day. Maybe she'd seen her dad run through by some Syrian thug. Heard her mum scream for mercy and then a terrible, sickening silence. All we know is that this girl suffered a tragedy beyond what we'd wish on our worst enemy. In a moment, she's wrenched from family, home, country to be a slave in a foreign land. Now, slavery really did mean slavery. It meant nothing. There's an ancient joke about two Greeks and the one complained to the other one and said, that slave that you sold me, he died. And the other one said, well, you were too soft on him. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, I'd never have given him permission to do a thing like that. And that was the condition of a slave. This little girl had nothing. In Israel, slaves had some protection, a little bit of hope of freedom in the year of Jubilee. But Syrian slaves, they had no hope. They were animals. They worked until they died. And so, kids, what I want you to do in your head is imagine a big seesaw for me, okay? And in verse 1, we met Naaman. And I want you to sit him down on one side of the seesaw, okay? Okay. Do you, do you get the impression from what we heard that Naaman is a little weedy guy? No, not even close, right? He's, he's a big, he's, he's a bit south than guy. He's like Josh on the back row, right? <laughs> you know. He's got muscles on his muscles. And then he's got his, his shiny armor on. And then he's got his gold medallions of state. You're just as good, Mark. Could have picked you as well. I just uh, want to include everyone. And... Um, and so we sat Naaman down on this side of the seesaw and on the other side we get verse 2 and 3 and we put down this little girl who's wearing nothing but slaves' robes. Now, who is up in the air and who's down on the ground? Who's going to stick a hand up and help me out? Savannah, you'll tell me. Who's down on the ground? It's 
Who's down on the ground? Naaman. Absolutely right. He's the big guy in this sea. And yet what we find is when we look more closely at this little girl, despite her poverty, this girl has two things that Naaman didn't have that are worth way, way more. Number one, she had health. Imagine a man from Iran who's got a million rial, that's the currency in 1,000 rial notes, all stacked up in big piles. So he's got 1,000, 1,000 rial notes in 10 piles of 100 notes. And then a Kiwi digs two twenty dollars out of his back pocket. And you'd say, well, which one would you rather have? And the reality is $40 is worth more than a million rial. See, it's not about how much you have, but what's it's worth. Now, now Naaman, he's got it all. But he's been asking the question, what's it worth? Because he's not sleeping at the moment because he has leprosy. It's the most feared disease in Syria. His armor might be the shiniest. His treasury might be packed to overflowing. He might have all the respect from having fought and fought his way to the top, but it all seems to be laughing at him and asking him, what's it worth when you haven't got your health? And then there's this little slave girl working in his house. And she's got no home. She's got no family, no rights. He could choke her to death. He could break her neck and nobody would blink. But she's rich. And he's poor because she's got a health. Health is a tremendous gift from God. And I encourage you, if you've got it, don't forget to thank him for it and don't forget to use it for him. But poor health can be a gift from God too. See, it was to Naaman. It opened his eyes and got him to start asking those questions. What is all this stuff that I've got really worth? The second thing that this girl has that Naaman doesn't have that's incredibly valuable is faith in the living God. See, we're told this girl was from the land of Israel. She was a Jew. And so she was being taught to pray and to sing the Psalms. And she knew about Moses and David. And she knew about God's recent work through the prophet prophet Elijah, how there'd been a, a revival in Israel because of this man's faithfulness. And she knew that his protege Elisha lived in Samaria and she genuinely believes that God has power to help and and that power is so immeasurable that it can even cure Naaman of this incurable disease see Naaman he's got all the idols of Syria but none of them had slowed the rot of his skin and this little girl knew that See, she's been in the household. She's watched her mistress running to the balcony when she hears news. Your husband's coming home. And she'd watched as the hope had drained out of her face as she looked out the window and saw her husband slumped in his saddle coming back from some pilgrimage to some distant temple or shrine not cured. And yet still this little girl watching all this, she believes. And even her own awful experience hadn't crushed that faith. Still she believed and acted on it. Verse 3, she said to her mistress, Would that my Lord were with the prophet who's in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. Christian, you look at what's happened with this little girl. Would your faith survive this trial? You're not too proud tonight, are you, to learn from a little girl? You know when scripture talks about childlike faith and we think it means weak faith? Doesn't this really make us reevaluate what the Bible means when it talks about childlike faith? We can learn from this girl. But we need to ask a question because she's got faith and we want to ask why? Because where has this God that she believes in been? Faith didn't protect her when the raiders came. All of her parents' determination to obey God hadn't saved them from terrible sorrow. Faith in God did nothing to protect her from hardship. And so why bother? Why believe? Psychologist Jordan Peterson says, life is suffering. Now that's the desperate chorus of a man who doesn't know Jesus Christ. Because although there's a lot of suffering in life, there is joy, unspeakable, 
in knowing Jesus. But a huge part of life is suffering. We all suffer. We can't get away from that because we live in a suffering world. Since man sinned, our world has been aching, groaning under a curse. And now if you try and do what culture tells you to do, which is live for pleasure and try and make yourself comfortable as you possibly can, you're doomed to fail in that. Because that worldview doesn't recognize that the world is under a curse. So you'll never truly be happy because you're in a world where being truly comfortable is as impossible as a fish trying to stay dry in his world. If you want to keep suffering out of your life, you're living on the wrong planet. And even if we achieve some kind of modicum of happiness on earth, it never lasts. Because there are three big thieves that are always waiting by the well to snatch it away like Syrian raiders. Here they are. Circumstances, sickness, and death. While those three exist, there's no hope of contentment. But we're still asking, what difference then does faith in God make if it won't save you from that hardship? Well, yeah, it won't save you from the hardship, but it is a vital lifeline in the hardship. See, God doesn't keep his children from trials, and every single one of us who's a Christian can testify to that, but he does give all that we need to remain committed to him in trials, and it's in that commitment that we find joy as we discover Jesus gives certainty in those circumstances, sanctification in sickness, and deliverance ultimately from death. Now, there are two specific medicines I want to share with you that the Lord Jesus gives to embattled Christians. And you'll remember them because they're both FP. Number one is faithfulness past. And so you imagine a little boy kicks his favorite ball and it goes down some abandoned well. And he tells his dad, uh, and dad ties a rope around his waist and the boy climbs down the well. But he never goes any further than his dad can see. And he never is allowed to go further than his dad thinks he'll have strength to pull him back up. And now you think of Peter on Lake Galilee as he gets his feet wet. And yet there is no threat that the Lord Jesus would ever let him drown. God won't stop you and me getting our feet wet. But he never let us sink an inch further than his boundless love allows. And so as we look at this little girl who suffered so greatly we mustn't forget that even in this, God was protecting her, hedging her about. That this girl didn't know and pinch more pain than he permitted. She hadn't been killed on that day in Israel. She wasn't maimed. She didn't suffer permanent physical scars. God kept her out of the Damascus brothels. He kept her off the altars of Syrian gods. And then God moved the second most powerful woman in the nation to choose this little girl to come and live and work in her beautiful home. See, none of us here know what God has kept us from. And that should move us to worship. And yet all of us here know quite a bit of what God has brought us through. And that should move us to worship. It was so, you know, encouraging, challenging here in Grant Kingsbury. Speak at prayer meeting a couple of nights ago about losing a teenage son and, and how hard that was. And yet being able to look back and give God thanks for the things that he's learned as a consequence of that. Who can, who can look back on a, on a tragedy like that with gratitude? And yet Grant could see there's mercies of growth and, and teaching and help from Christian friends and a communion with, uh, with believers in fellowship and a closeness to God, those treasures that can only be found in the dark mine of difficulty. And so when we come through those trials, God's faithfulness passed, it becomes a, a stronger and stronger rope around us that confirms his determination to see us home to heaven. We look at, you think of um, 
Newton's great hymn, Be Gone Unbelief. And each sweet Ebenezer I have in review confirms his good place. You know, all those things God's done for me past, it just fills me with confidence he's going to lead me securely home to heaven and provide everything that I need for tomorrow. The second FP is this, it's future promises. Because despite her situation, this little girl can cling to the, the promises that God has given. See, the God that she believes in was committed to her people. And she'd have known Psalm 146, verse 5, Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The, Lord's lift, the Lord lifts up those who are bowed low. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. Some people have asked, did this girl ever get back to Israel? Did God ever bring her home to her land? And a lot of preachers have speculated that Naaman, after being cured, came back so grateful he released this girl from her bondage. We've got no evidence of that at all. The, the only bit of Israel this girl may have seen in her life was what came back on Naaman's boots. But one day the fullness of God's promise would be realized and she would go to her real home. And, and just hear these words, Zechariah 9.11. God says, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I'll set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. The promises of God, Christian, are here for you to give you hope. We read that, didn't we? Romans chapter 15, verse 4. I won't forget it now after embarrassingly taking 20 minutes to find it in my notes earlier. Romans 15, verse 4. It's all written to give you hope, that to strengthen your grip on the Lord Jesus, to remind you that whatever happens in this life, God has an ultimate, glorious end guaranteed by a covenant signed in Jesus' blood. Now understand that does not make our faith a wispy, passive thing. In, in Les Miserables, there's a little servant girl called Cosette, and, and she works for a horrible couple of people. And she spends a day sweeping the floor and, and cleaning this, this house, and she sings to herself. She says, there is a castle on a cloud. I like to go there in my sleep. There aren't any floors for me to sweep, not in my, not in my castle on a cloud. I know a place where no one's lost. I know a place where no one cries. Crying at all is not allowed, not in my castle and a cloud. Is that what this little servant girl had? An emotional crutch, a fairy tale pipe dream to get her through life? Or not even close. Hers is a faith that changes life that really impacts it. It's a faith with power to transform her world. And that's what you and I need. This is why we have to sit at this girl's feet and say, Holy Spirit, teach me what you've done in this girl's life because I need a faith that doesn't live when I come through that door and die when I go out of it again. I need a faith that affects life because faith without that is, Scripture says, dead. See, this little girl had every reason to work reluctantly for Naaman. He'd taken everything from her. He was the, the face to the army of Syria that had robbed her of all of her happiness. If she had slipped poison in his cocoa, we'd all say fair play. But she didn't. She worked her socks off to make sure the cocoa was the best name it had ever tasted. She should be awful and yet she's exceptional. Now God wants you and me to work hard even when we're working for those who don't deserve it. You think of Daniel. God loves this, doesn't he? You think of Daniel working for Nebuchadnezzar. You think of Joseph working for Potiphar. Potiphar's blown away by his work ethic. And then you add to their company this nameless little girl living in Syria. We've got to apply this. 
We might not be slaves in Syria, but we do face situations in Southland that have similarities. We are all people under authority. And we see here how we have to behave when that authority, or even when that authority, is corrupt and godless. And so I'm speaking now to wives with domineering husbands, employees with iron-fisted bosses, farmers with nosy primary industry officers knocking on the door, kids with nasty teachers, Kiwis with godless government sportsmen, with taskmaster coaches, and Christians with heavy-handed or maybe far too soft church leaders. And I'm also speaking to everybody who doesn't feel oppressed because if this little girl could live and serve a wicked master, how much more should you love and serve your respectful, loving wife, kids, neighbor, friends? How can we emulate this girl's example? Now, I'm going to give you a little warning. This is hard. And I was writing it in my study, and I'm thinking, I'm, man, it's so tough. But it's all spelled out for us in the command that Jesus gives Christian slaves in Ephesians chapter 6 that we read earlier. I'm going to read a couple of verses to you again, verse 5 and 6. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. Those are revolutionary words. This is what Jesus expects from his slave, enslaved, this is how Jesus expects his people who are enslaved to treat their masters who, who are possibly treating them awfully and I don't always treat my wife this well. Break it up. See how hard this is. Verse 5, the first part, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear. You might, wanna, you might find it helpful just to turn back to Ephesians 6 and verse 5 and 6. Obey your earthly masters with respect and fear. When Naaman's wife gave a, a list of chores, this little girl never said no. She had no right to resist. When she felt overwhelmed with sadness or homesickness, she still must obey. And the kids must learn then. You guys... You have to learn that when mum and dad say yes or no, there's no why or but about it. We respect and we obey. Wives must love the husband who doesn't love them back. Employees need to think long and hard about whether they have the right to strike. Church members must never grumble or grow bitter even when their leaders make silly decisions. Not to complain, but to honor. Then see, you've got to do that with sincerity of heart, with a sincere heart. It's not enough to pretend and do it. You can't say yes sir, no sir, three bags full sir in the moment that you're home complain to anyone who will listen. The God who looks at your heart expects you to change your attitude and pray for a genuine concern and a desire from in here to do good to that person who drives you mad in the kitchen when you try and help on a Sunday night or who lets you down again and again with their poor organization. And notice the last part of verse 5. You do it as you would Christ. As you would Christ. Now we see how deep this thing goes because it's saying so clearly and plainly for us that if there is the tiniest gap, the slightest bit of distance between how you serve your boss, wife, family or your church and how you would serve Jesus, if he personally commissioned you to do something for him, you are not obeying God's word. It seems ridiculous. 
It seems impossible to do. And then it gets even worse. Verse 6. Not by the way of eye service, not as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. It's got to be genuine and it's got to be from the heart. It has to be a passion that drives you. Your work for a bad boss. Your marriage to a stubborn wife. Your citizenship under a morally corrupt government. All of it is part of your worship to Jesus. And you must treat the most undeserving with honor, respect and love to the same degree that you show it to Him. Now that seems impossible, but it's there. We can't get away from the reality of it. And so as we look at a text like that, we have to say some of us need a drastic change to how we're living. And though that means hard work, though it means getting on our knees and praying for heart change, it is so worth it. Because a group of people really applying this and living this way, like this little girl, would be so stunningly different from the world around us. Now you know why that's important. Because I didn't fall for Sarah because she's just like everybody else. I didn't run home to dad and say, I've met this girl, there's nothing unique about her. She's got the personality of a bowl of porridge and I can't wait to marry her. I said, no, there's something about her that makes her more beautiful than anyone I know. And so Wyndham needs to see Christians who are different need to see people whose lives really have been changed and impacted by God. They need to see something otherworldly in you. They need to see people whose faith doesn't sing about heaven and then hide from the world, who don't just sing about a castle in the clouds to get them through, but who have faith in action that does what the Bible says and then shines the beauty of that, which is the beauty of Christ, into our community. Let me read a little bit to you from a sermon from my old pastor. He says this, Naaman's wife had never had such a slave who was interested, wise for her age, respectful and caring. What made a girl like this? Did she ask her servant why she wasn't bitter at being taken from her family? Then the girl could witness to the help that she had had from the God of Israel and his goodness. Nothing the girl did was insignificant and nothing you do is insignificant. And when you get up on Monday morning facing the tasks, facing the drudgery of each week, there you too are all servants of the Lord. Show it. Show it in your work. Show it in everything that you do. Wherever you are, never feel a sense of drudgery again. Your job may be mechanical, repetitive, soulless, but you must think, I'm doing this for him who loved me and put me in this place. That's the key to achieving this. Remembering the love that we owe Jesus in light of his great love for you that at the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin there's nothing else with power to make us faithful servants of Christ and of our world than the love of the Lord Jesus this is why you and I must hear the gospel every week because what can motivate us like the dying love of our Savior? What could change the world other than the Holy Spirit revealing to us the depth to which the Lord Jesus cherishes us that then produces faith? A faith that, that works and then changes the world. Let's, let's pray.